And whenever you're ready, Dan. Okay. So, uh, good afternoon. Um, my name is Dan Bennett. I'm the CEO at Gifford Medical Center. Um, this is our uh, agenda for the day, which uh, is familiar probably for everybody who's um, been in any of these hearings, hearings this year. It's standard format. Uh, this is uh, our team uh, here at the table and uh, at the uh, table uh, behind. Um, again, I'm Dan Bennett. Uh, to my right is uh, Jeff Hebert. Jeff is our CFO. Uh, Rebecca Overy, to my left, is our Vice President of Operations. Uh, Dr. Josh White uh, is our Chief Medical Officer. And uh, Katrina Lumbra is our Controller. So I'll start out, this is our, uh, this is our org chart. Um, those of you on the Green Mountain Care Board have uh, seen this before. Um, Gifford does have a uh, somewhat unique uh, structure in that uh, our parent organization is a federally qualified health center, uh, one of three organizations in the country that have that structure. Uh, under the FQHC, we have Gifford Medical Center, which is, um, as you know, a critical access hospital, and uh, that is the entity we'll be uh, discussing uh, today in this budget hearing. Uh, we have a third uh, organization in our structure called Gifford Retirement Community, which consists of um, a, a nursing home, an independent living uh, community, and two adult day programs. Um, we have uh, in the uh, slides we provided um, some overview of the uh, organizations uh, that are within the Gifford umbrella. Um, we have a number of locations uh, from White River Junction to Berlin and uh, points in between. We are centered in uh, Randolph and uh, offer uh, services to communities uh, throughout, our, uh, throughout our area. Um, what is not reflected in our uh, organizational chart is um, what we do to uh, complete our mission. And uh, Gifford is a community health organization. Um, we are a community hospital. And as such, uh, you're going to hear the word community come out of my uh, mouth uh, quite a few times here today. Um, we are an organization that is focused on our community, uh, and we're an organization that enjoys the support and participation of our community. What I have here up on the screen right now is a listing of uh, a number of activities that we've undertaken uh, in the past year uh, focused around community health and community outreach. Um, this is important because it speaks to the investments that Gifford makes uh, on a daily basis and on an ongoing basis uh, to community health based on the, uh, the, the needs that are in our community and with uh, many partners within our community. Those partners include our school systems, uh, they include our uh, food banks, uh, both our local food bank and statewide uh, food bank as well law enforcement entities, senior centers, our designated agency, a, a local nonprofit that uh, does mobile health services, including mobile dental services that we work with them on, our local recreation program, and uh, this year also with Rise Vermont uh, through One Care Vermont. Uh, we uh, started a partnership with them. Uh, that has been a good marriage because uh, it, brings to, uh, it brings to our uh, disposal their resources and their assistance to continue the good work that we've been doing for years and the relationships that we've built within our community. Um, in short, uh, Gifford is making a lot of uh, investments in our community uh, focused on primary, uh, on primary care in conjunction with our FQHC, focused on population health through our work in One Care Vermont, uh, through our community health and outreach programs. Um, and as I noted, our community turns that around and supports Gifford as well. And that was uh, never as apparent as it was uh, this past weekend when we hosted our annual Last Mile Ride event, which is an event um, where we uh, work with our community members to raise money to assist individuals and their families at the end of life. Um, we had uh, a total of 497 uh, uh, people who participated. Next year, that number will be over 500, I'm quite certain. Uh, we had 54 business sponsors who participated, and we raised over $120,000, uh, again, to assist individuals and families uh, at the end of life. Uh, over the 14 years that we have uh, held this event, we've raised $876,000. Uh, towards end-of-life care, and that is all money that goes back to benefit our community members. Um, that 
Um, if nothing else, I want people to understand what it means to be a community health organization. It's understanding what the needs are in your community, and it's mobilizing your efforts to, uh, to meet those needs, working with your other uh, partner organization. Uh, Gifford does that very well, and we look forward to continuing that in the future. Um, I also want to just say thank you to the Green Mountain Care Board. Uh, at the end of May, uh, you came out to Gifford and held um, one of your uh, public meetings. You also took the time to uh, go with our staff and see some of the programs, see some of these collaborations uh, that we have uh, underway. Um, uh, that is incredibly important, I believe, uh, for you as well as you're um, doing your work to understand uh, what is happening in the communities, what it means to be a community hospital. Um, and uh, I thank you for uh, taking the time and effort to come out to, uh, to Gifford and to our communities uh, and see what's going on uh, on the ground. Uh, the other investment that uh, Gifford uh, has made, and we've made for the past several years, but really has started to show itself in the financial statements that, um, that you see on a regular basis, is the investment we've made in uh, mobilizing uh, expense reduction efforts uh, throughout our organization. Uh, those efforts have been very successful. They've involved people throughout our organization, um, and um, uh, it is reflected in, uh, the, uh, in the financial results that, uh, that you see as well as in our budget uh, moving forward. So uh, on that note, uh, we are here to talk about uh, our uh, budget and our finances, so I'm going to turn it over uh, to Jeff to take that the next step. All right, starting with our revenue, um, we did include the appendix that uh, um, were in our narrative, but Specifically looking at our gross revenue um, and looking at the uh, revenue streams, our inpatient revenue, um, we have this year um, experienced lower patient days. However, our discharges are at expectations. Um, and so because of that, uh, we are budgeting our FY19 um, projections um, for um, our FY20 uh, budgets. In regards to outpatient, again, we are using the 2019 projections to um, predict our 2020 budgets. And with our clinic revenue streams, we are um, increasing them slightly. In 2018, we instituted a new EMR. Our providers uh, um, took basically 18 and 19 um, to get up to speed. And uh, because of that, they're getting more efficient. Um, so we have uh, um, put some slight increases in revenue due to that. Looking at net revenue, specifically at our payers, um, when we uh, um, looked at our expense increases as compared to the ex um, inflationary increases that Medicare expects. Um, we see that our uh, um, inflationary increases on expenses overall are about three to four percent. So we are expecting due to our cost-based reimbursement to see that net revenue um, or that increase uh, um, with our rate increase with Medicare. With Medicaid, we did not budget uh, um, any increase uh, due to the rate increase with the commercial um, we do have that built in. Um, the other thing that we saw this year from 2019 to 2020, we did see as our community ages that uh, we um, experienced a movement from our commercial payers to Medicare, so that's built into our budget as well. For DISH, we did have a slight decrease and that is reflected in the budget. Looking at our five-year net patient revenue, um, we have, uh, um, and we did want to put this slide in to communicate that in FY14, um, you see that uh, it was at 58 million, and then it dropped in 15, and, uh, um, and what we wanted to communicate is in FY14, um, Dan reviewed that organizational structure for Gifford. Prior to FY14, our organizational structure was GMC. Um, GMC included our nursing home. GMC included our FQHC, or our primary care practices. In 14, um, we saw that uh, um, we had revenues for uh, GHC, which is the FQHC, of 2.5 million, and then the nursing home of 3 million. And so um, we actually, in 15, um, that became its own separate corporation. So that revenue now was not you know, in our budget submission. 
And then in 16, we were able to move our nursing home. Um, it was a hospital-based nursing home. It was a department of the hospital. We moved it uh, about two miles up uh, Route 66, so it became an independent. So that revenue was also removed. So this is just basically restating the numbers. Um, when we do look at the uh, um, overall numbers, the one year that uh, you know um, we did experience um, definitely a shortfall was 18. Um, which we have been uh, um, getting back on our uh, um, feet uh, for 19 and into 20. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so you've heard uh, us uh, talk about uh, some of the issues we've had around uh, workforce. Um, I can report that um, we uh, have seen improvements in regard to our physician workforce over uh, the last uh, year. Uh, we currently um, have one position that we have open in radiology, um, which is a um, significant change from what we've uh, seen in the past years. Uh, we do uh, continue to utilize some uh, traveling staff, particularly in our uh, operating room. Uh, however, we have uh, put in place some longer term uh, solutions there that um, are going to be favorable uh, moving forward. Uh, we continue to have the same issues as everybody else with a tight labor market. Uh, and that is throughout our organization, not just uh, physicians and, nurse, and nurses, but also environmental services, nutrition and food services, um, and uh, across our practices as well. One of the issues that um, we have been working to address is uh, access to capital in order to uh, ensure that we um, are able to uh, meet our need to invest in uh, equipment and uh, our plant. Uh, our age of plant uh, has been rising. Uh, the last couple of years, we've um, uh, depended upon our uh, cash reserves, given our financial position, to uh, in order to fund our capital expenses. Uh, moving forward, we need to be able to return to funding those capital expenses through our uh, operating, um, by generating uh, cash through operations. Uh, we also um, continue to participate in the all-payer model. Uh, in 2019, we are participating in the Medicaid program. In 2020, we will continue to participate in the Medicaid program, and we also are uh, going to be a participant in the uh, Cigna uh, program as well. Um, as we're looking at our uh, continued, um, uh, continuing to expand our participation in that, the uh, ability to take on risk is uh, a big issue for us and one that we will um, be continuing to work with OneCare uh, on uh, as we go forward. Um, so I just talked about a couple of areas of, um, of risk uh, in regard to um, our, our workforce uh, and also in regard to our uh, access to capital. Um, as I noted earlier and uh, as you've seen in our finances, uh, we have done uh, a, um, a significant amount of uh, cost reduction work. We've been very successful in doing that. Um, we do feel that um, you know, there's a limit to how much further we can go with that, given what's available to us. So um, uh, most of the, the, the big items uh, that we're able to capture in cost reduction, we have done that. Um, we also continue, um, I talked about uh, the difficulty in um, recruiting uh, staff and a workforce issue. Uh, one of the issues in, uh, that does exist in Vermont in rural areas is uh, the issue of being able to have opportunities for people who come with a spouse or family members. Uh, we currently are in the process of losing a pediatrician uh, because uh, her spouse um, uh, and his uh, needs uh, for work. Uh, we also, uh, in the last um, several months, um, had a a candidate for a psychiatry position who um, was interested in coming, but again, in the end, chose another position because uh, her spouse could not uh, find a position uh, here. So that is something that uh, continues to be an issue as well. Uh, there are a lot of opportunities as well, uh, and I'm going to turn it over to Rebecca to talk about some of those. It's a big microphone. It is a big microphone. Hi, thanks for having us here. Um, I get to talk about the opportunities that we have, and um, as Dan said earlier, we have a lot of community outreach going on. Um, this has been a really big focus for us this year as we've been focusing on wellness, uh, preventative health care, and um, we've had a lot of focus on the youth 
um, in our area in, in educating them. Um, so we've been really growing our connection with our primary care practices and um, focusing on care coordination. So working with our community health care teams, the discharge planners, um, whether that's within our own organization or other organizations, we've really tried to grow those relationships so that we are helping the patients to navigate what can be a really confusing uh, period of time in their lives. Um, the outreach that we've been doing, focusing on some of the youth in our area, we've partnered with our local police and sheriff's office uh, to bring the LEAD program, which is the Law Enforcement Against Drugs, into schools. We've also had programs on bullying and how to learn some techniques to handle sort of negative peer pressure as kids move from grade to grade to grade. Um, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of focus on how to handle situations like people who are trying to lure you into vaping, which we have all learned we don't know anything about, um, and uh, we need to keep our kids safe from that. Um, Dan was mentioning in our community partnerships, those are really important to us, and we gain a lot of traction with care coordination and partnering with all of those local entities that we are able to work with in the different communities that we serve. Um, as mentioned up there, we have started our post-acute care clinic, which is been a, a really great way of keeping our folks um, after discharge from the hospital from going back into the hospital prematurely by meeting with them 48 to 72 hours after discharge to go over their medications with them, make sure they understand their treatment plan. Patients want to go home when they're in the hospital and not all the time do they remember all the things that they need to be focusing on once they get there. We want to make sure they have all of those pieces um, in place to surround them. Um, working with our um, the, our, our substance use programs. We have a great team that's providing uh, free Narcan in one of our centers. Um, we've provided a lot of education to our community about that. We have our drug take back kiosk, I never quite say that right, um, that's been amazing in our main campus, um, but in our prim primary care clinics within our areas, we've got all of our uh, take back envelopes that I am replenishing pretty much on a weekly basis, 25 to 50 of those envelopes. Um, so that's been really, um, really a great thing for us. Um, Dan also mentioned that we're partnering with Health Hub. Um, we have this mobile trailer that is providing preventative care to kids and adults. Um, the adults has been something that we've been really focusing on through our primary care clinics, is making sure that um, folks know that you don't have to be a, a child to get those services. And um, checking on the numbers today, because uh, they're moving out Friday, they've been with us most of the summer, we've doubled the number of patients that we've seen from last year to this year with Health Hub, which has been super exciting for us. And the last thing I wanted to touch on was um, the, the athletic trainer program, um, which has been a great way for us to work closer with our schools um, and getting our students really active and participating in their health and wellness. Um, the thing I wanted to highlight is this summer we had a program with our local high school where we had the athletic trainer um, volunteer, to, well, volunteer to work with kids over a seven week period of time. She had eight to ten kids each time to work on prevention, injury prevention, endurance training, and um, just making sure that they're going to be healthy in the coming year, sort of not losing all that time over the summer so that we can really look over the course of the next school year to see how well that's worked. And the last thing that she's doing this week is um, three different in-services on nutrition and how to fuel your body um, and how that makes such a big difference to them. The, the response has been really overwhelming and the parents have been um, just super excited to participate in this with the kids. So we're excited to see how, how our adolescents fare over this coming year that, um, that have gone through this program with us. Right. Uh, jumping into our indicators, um, looking at the, um, basically the indicators that uh, um, we look at, one of the uh, key indicators was our debt service coverage ratio. Again, um, FY18 for Gifford was a, a difficult year. Um, this indicator um, in 18 shows that we were at negative 1.3. Um, but looking at uh, all the cost savings initiatives, getting our PL back to where it uh, um, needs to be, still has a little ways to go, but uh, um, we've been able to get that uh, turned around and we're at 2.1. 
Moving over to the long-term debt to capitalization, in 2003, um, we did have a need to also reinvest into the facility, into our um, infrastructure. And at that time, we did uh, have the um, opportunity to uh, get a bond for Gifford Medical Center. Um, we took that uh, um, and uh, we did uh, um, receive that bond. Right now, overall, um, as of uh, uh, 2019, that bond, uh, we have a, a payable of about $18 million on it. And because of that, it puts us in a higher bracket uh, um, or a higher uh, um, situation ranking with our long-term debt to capitalization. Again, Dan had communicated one of our major concerns uh, is our age of plant, which is in the bottom uh, left-hand corner. And uh, we are one of the higher um, plants as we um, sit with our, uh, um, with our plant, and we need to uh, um, start to address that. Our days and net receivable, um, those for us, um, we feel are doing very well. Days cash on hand, um, you know, when we got that bond in 2003, we took the opportunity to start putting uh, uh, money into funded depreciation um, so that, uh, um, you know, we were able to, if we were put into a situation, draw those funds down. Um, that has been very beneficial to us, uh, especially with our, um, you know, our bond covenants. Um, we've had a lot of uh, work with uh, um, the banks as well as our auditors, and one of the saving uh, um, indicators that's really been helping us out was our days cash on hand where we were postured. So we did have a, you know, a poor um, debt service coverage ratio, but then when you put it against the days cash on hand, that helped us out quite, uh, quite a lot. Days payable um, look fine. Um, moving down to the operating margin, again, um, we ended the year at negative 10.7% uh, margin. Um, we've got that uh, right now we are projecting um, it to be 0.8%. Uh, and when we take a look at our total margin, we have that at uh, six, you know, in 2018 was at negative 6.2%. And right now we have that projecting at 3.7%. We put this graph up to historically show um, that overall, when we take a look at our operating margin, Gifford, um, you know, we take pride in the, uh, um, you know, for those 15 years that we were able to meet, you know, our budgeted expectations. Um, in 17, as well as 18, um, that hasn't uh, um, been the case, but uh, we are getting that back in line. And uh, um, we are an organization that once we uh, get back on track, you know, we feel confident that that's uh, where we'll stay. These graphs are um, more of illustration. We wanted to uh, show a lot of the indicators are repetitive, but uh, what uh, we um, had them in the presentation for was to communicate. This is something that uh, we always, every month, submit to our board for their review, um, and as well as the annual debt, days cash on hand. In regards to the profit and loss statement, um, you know, that was requested. Um, if there's any specific questions, I can definitely take. Uh, we just put the um, profit and loss, the balance sheet, and the cash flow statement. Um, taking a look at, of a, um, at our reconciliation from actual 19 to budget 19. At the beginning of the presentation, communicated that we have seen a uh, shift in our patient days, that they're lower. Um, our discharges are at expectations, but that is causing um, the main uh, reason that our inpatient revenues are below budgeted expectation. Moving down to our outpatient revenue, um, our ER um, has been up, it's been down, but uh, over the year-to-date numbers, uh, we have been lower than expected, so that's contributing to uh, um, our some of our outpatient shortfalls. Last year when we came to this group, uh, we were talking about um, general surgery, um, getting that uh, program for Gifford back on its, uh, um, you know, back up and running to where it needs to be. Um, in the beginning of the fiscal year, we actually, um, our two uh, general surgeons started, they're doing very well. Um, what we have seen in 19, however, is our other um, surgery uh, um, has come down um, in regards to uh, um, what we expected it to be. And with our clinics, that's also then flowing into our clinic revenue streams as well. Salaries and benefits. Um, when we looked at, uh, um, you know, what's been happening, um, we have uh, um, reduced our salaries um, due to our uh, volume expectations. Um, our provider tax, uh, um, because of our um, revenue being um, below expectation, um, we have seen that come in lower. 
And this one, I'm not, uh, you know, uh, uh, our depreciation and, uh, um, you know, we keep looking. We um, meet on a, a weekly basis in regards to our expenses. And one of those areas that uh, we've been kind of, you know, looking for savings is our depreciation in regards to, you know, capital purchases as to what we can and cannot do for this year. So we're seeing the savings there. Interest in long term. Um, is up and that's because we had to refinance our bonds so we are spreading those expenses and then other operating um, we have uh, due to cost savings initiative our supplies are doing um, well um, and uh, our insurances are uh, um, down as well um, as well as all of the other expenses So in regard to our uh, expense drivers, uh, we've talked about our, our workforce, um, our utilization of um, temporary staff, whether that's physicians or nurses, as I noted, um, is less than it had been in uh, previous, previous years. So we are uh, seeing some uh, positive moves there in reducing those uh, costs. Uh, that being said, um, you know, we are a small organization and all it takes is one or two people um, leaving for another uh, leaving uh, their position to uh, drive those uh, costs upwards. So that'll be continuing to be something that uh, there is some, some risk around for us. Uh, I noted the, uh, the labor market. Um, uh, that's not a new story that you've heard. Uh, that continues to be an issue. Um, I talked a little bit about the age of plant um, uh, before and our um, ability to meet our master facility plan, which we did uh, complete a new plan. Uh, this year looking forward for five years um, and uh, that is um, uh, the capital budget that you'll see uh, in a minute is reflective of the planning process that we went through there um, we do continue um, to see an overall inflation in uh, in health care cost that um, outstrips the uh, the cost of uh, inflation in other areas of the economy uh, whether that's around uh, wages or whether that's around pharmaceutical costs, uh, other supplies, uh, we do uh, continue to see uh, pressures in those areas. So we've had a couple of uh, cost saving initiatives this year, um, and one of them was our lighting project that's noted up there, which was, again, another great partnership that we had with Efficiency Vermont. We've worked with um, Efficiency Vermont with many of our programs over the years, with, uh, especially when we're renovating, we bring them in and have them look at our plans and give us ideas. So this was a really proactive plan that we worked on with them um, when they came and reviewed the hospital itself to replace all of our old fixtures with LEDs, which of course are dimmable. Um, so they've gone through our main campus and provided these lights that are much more user friendly, I think. And they, um, like I said, they dim, but they also go to sleep. So if their room is unoccupied, they just sort of dim out. And then as you walk by them, they light back up, but they're preset to actually come on and then come down to a level that you've pre-selected, which for staff and patients has been a really great thing to have happen because the light is the way you want it and not feeling so bright and artificial. Um, but again, I think that you know, part of the story for me is the, is the community partnership with Efficiency Vermont. This, those people are pretty amazing, um, and they have a different way of looking at a project. So it's, uh, we're hoping to see a lot more benefits from that project that they've just completed. Um, we had a relocation of a service. We had a practice in Wilder um, that's a physical therapy practice that we have been re leasing the space for a long time. and. Um, with a very minimal renovation in our White River Junction <laughs> practice, we were able to move the Wilder practice into that uh, footprint. Um, that practice in uh, White River Junction has needed some, some work. It needs a facelift. Um, it's needed it for many years. Uh, it's been a fin pretty inefficient um, footprint to that plant, and we were able to um, with just a little bit of tweaks here and there, renovate that space and move that practice of uh, Wilder Advanced Physical Therapy into that building. Um, we have urology and um, podiatry there now as well, so it's a really great marriage uh, between those two, those three specialties. Um, our community investment, as far as looking at food insecurity, um, I mentioned earlier we've been really looking at nutrition and how to help people improve their health. 
and well-being through nutrition. Um, we are partnering with the Vermont Food Bank and our area, Randolph Area Food Shelf, um, to do a couple of really nice things this year. Um, we've been trying to get Veggie Van Gogh to our uh, hospital for a few years. They generally partner with um, hospitals and schools to bring fresh fruits and veggies, just they're free, come get them, uh, to folks who might otherwise not be able to afford to get that kind of nutrition um, in their food supply. So we've, um, we've had them here. They come the second Thursday of every month, and they're there for about an hour and a half. And um, this last time that they were here, it's our fourth month of having them here, um, we served 341 families, in that m most of them in the first hour. Um, and that was pretty amazing to us. We've seen it grow. Um, it's clearly people who are in need. We've worked with another community partner, Stagecoach, to kind of go around town a little more frequently and stop at Gifford a little more frequently during that span of time every month. Um, and it's been pretty amazing. We actually pre-package some uh, of those bags and give them to the senior centers for folks who can't actually come out to Gifford and um, pick up the food during that time. Uh, the last thing that I want to talk about with this is this program that we have, and we're calling them the, the Gifford Green Bags. Um, we have these Gifford Green Bags that are available in all of our primary care practices and also within our community health care team um, that are pre-packaged with um, uh, basically two days of food, um, shelf-stable food for families who need immediate, need immediate access to food. Um, we've heard some pretty amazing stories from our pediatrics department and some of our primary care departments um, about people who just need food right now. They can't get to the food shelf. They don't have um, the ability to travel to get this, you know, these services, whatever it is, that we can just hand them a bag of food that has no stigma attached because it's in a Gifford bag. It could be band-aids and, you know, bandages. Nobody, nobody really knows. Um, and have folks leave with the food. And inside those bags, we have the information of how to access our community health care team, the food shelf, Veggie Van Gogh, et cetera. Um, and we're actually partnering with our EMS teams in our communities to figure out a way to get them to be able to have a few of those bags available as well as they're entering you know, people's homes to provide these house call visits with them. We've also given them to a couple of um, free clinics and we have um, given them to our local library. We're trying to identify areas where kids go like after school or people show up. Because um, we've noticed that with our families a lot of times the parents are willing to sort of make that, you know, trip into the food shelf or whatever because of their kids. We notice that a lot of our elderly folks are not willing to do that. So just being able to hand them that food makes us feel like we've made a difference and maybe they'll be a little more open to the idea of letting us help them with that. So moving to our capital, um, overall, uh, our capital for this upcoming year is maintenance only capital. Um, it's for um, items that have come, um, they're at their end of life. Looking at our buildings and building services, we do have on the, um, the uh, uh, you know, we're planning on doing a pretty expansive OBGYN interior renovation. This is the space that was freed up when we went with our private rooms. Um, we'll be renovating that to accommodate our OB um, clinic. Um, the other uh, big project for us this upcoming year is our gamma camera. That is definitely at its end of life um, and then some. Um, the first part of it, uh, the 335000 is the actual renovations to get the new unit in place. If we take a look at our major movable, um, the gamma camera of 670000 um, is the actual camera that we'll put in place. Information systems comes up as the number two uh, major movable uh, type of item. Um, there are a bunch of little projects that just, um, you know, will equate to a large project. Um, laptops, licenses, um, and the sort. We have a, uh, um, a replacement uh, um, for an x-ray, and then um, our other major movable by service areas um, are listed. So uh, our, our financial outlook at uh, Gifford um, is wrapped around our, um, our model of care and that we uh, are an organization that um, has an integrated model around primary care along with our hospital and with our community health um, programming and initiatives. 
Uh, we have done a lot of work, as we've noted, around cost reductions and efficiencies. We've uh, also had some success in rebuilding our staff in areas where that was required. Uh, that now puts us in a situation where we are able to better focus on uh, those activities that are in keeping with the goals of the all payer model, including uh, a focus on uh, reducing the total cost of care for people um, uh, in our population, in our communities. And I'm going to ask uh, Dr. White to talk about uh, some of the work we're doing uh, to that end. Good afternoon and thank you. Uh, addressing total cost of care has largely fallen into two realms for us uh, to begin with. There are the standard uh, quality initi initiatives, uh, a couple of which I will highlight. Uh, within the last couple of years, we have, in partnership with DHMC, employed an orthopedist who has fellowship training in uh, joint replacement. Uh, his specialization in techniques has resulted in a decrease in our average length of stay between fourth quarter of 17 and fourth quarter of 18 from six days in the hospital to 2.9 days. Uh, our antibiotic stewardship team has done extensive work with antibiotic utilization. Uh, on uh, February of 2018, uh, we were utilizing 531 days of antibiotics per thousand patient days. This has been reduced to 213 days as of April 19th, a 60% reduction. That comes with uh, obvious direct costs uh, as well as reduction in length of stay and uh, reduction in the complications associated with antibiotic utilization. Uh, as mentioned previously, we have been focusing on our post-acute care clinic. Um, this uh, allows the opportunity to address uh, patient understanding and compliance of the plan in their care as well as medications. Uh, it allows us the opportunity to identify problems and failures in the plan of care early as the patient follows up. As was previously mentioned, it's not unusual for our patients to be somewhat confused with their disease process at the time of hospitalization and simultaneously in a hurry to get home, uh, such that this addresses an additional touch point to make sure that things are getting done correctly. Uh, ultimately, uh, the goal here is to reduce uh, unnecessary ED visits and readmissions. Uh, we have had the opportunity to start to utilize the One Care Vermont uh, data set uh, with Workbench, uh, which is highly advantageous in addressing specific problems as it allows us the opportunity to drill down to specific provider and patient costs such that we can identify exactly where problems are. Uh, and uh, uh, ultimately, this is uh, uh, even more useful as the data is quite timely, uh, only being a couple of months old. Um, uh, in our recent uh, uh, data received from them, um, uh, imaging has uh, been identified as a target and we have initiated studies in terms of is it specific providers, specific departments or system-wide image utilization that needs to be addressed and we have already initiated projects. Given uh, quality projects a target from that data set, that is the ideal one as there are numerous pre-existing uh, strategies to address this issue. The second aspect of reduction in total cost of care focuses on social determinants of need. Ultimately, uh, a number of failures in the medical plan are not a product of the medical plan, but a product of the patient's inability uh, or misunderstanding of that plan such that they cannot comply. When patients are faced with questions like, am I going to buy food this week or am I going to purchase my medications? Um, we have a uh, uh, burgeoning addiction medicine service, um, which uh, has included in it uh, Narcan distribution, the take, take back kiosk as mentioned, uh, specialists, um, and then we have recently introduced a rapid access to medication program through our emergency department such that uh, opiate dependent individuals can start treatment uh, at the time of arrival to the emergency department even if their chief complaint does not specifically relate to substance abuse. Um, the PACC also addresses the opportunity for social determinants of need 
a recent study we ran in May looking at the 30-day readmissions to the hospital identified that none of those patients uh, had uh, made their follow-up appointment. Subsequently, we have started a study into exactly why, and the suspicion is a lot of that has to do with transportation, uh, which brings about the need to offer services uh, at Gifford that patients otherwise may not be able to achieve and do what we can to reach patients at uh, their homes such that they don't have to travel. Uh, this brings me to the uh, uh, rural paramedicine program. We have a small EMS service which is uh, engaged in uh, at-home visits um, such that we can do social and observational interaction with these patients uh, and identify things that may not other, otherwise be apparent in a clinic visit. Um, do you have opportunity to make your next visit? Do you understand your uh, medications that you're so, supposed to be taking? Do you even have those medications? Is the heat on? We've applied through One Care of Vermont for an innovation grant to expand this to all of the EMS services in District 8. Uh, and uh, uh, the idea being identify issues early, uh, issues that the patient uh, might not otherwise share, and again, reduce uh, readmissions as well as unnecessary ED visits. So overall, the long-range financial outlook. Um, Gifford has uh, um, been using a tool um, for many years. It's a five-year uh, um, planning tool that uh, um, will be uh, um, every year goes to our board for, uh, um, for review. Um, looking at it this year, um, one of the key areas that uh, um, came up on the radar was our average age of plant and the need to address that age of plant. Um, overall, we as an organization look to try to um, aspire to a triple B setting and we are, um, you know, as we work on trying to get our age of plant back where we need to, um, needs to be in 2024, we still feel that uh, we need to uh, continue to work on that. The other uh, indicators that will come out from that five-year planning tool um, are up, you know, we look at current ratio, days cash on hand, days in AR, um, cash to debt, debt to capitalization, um, and the debt service coverage ratio. Again, this uh, um, slide does represent uh, um, Gifford as a whole. Gifford as a whole is Gifford Medical Center, Gifford Healthcare, and Gifford Retirement Community. A review of the historical compliance. The first is our net patient revenue. Um, again, wanted to point out, uh, and that's where GHC and GRC um, have arrows. That's when uh, we actually excluded those revenue streams from that. Um, and also to point out that, uh, unfortunately, for FY18, we did see um, a dramatic reduction. Um, but we're getting back to where um, we hope and need to be. And then looking at operating margin, this is a graph that you've already seen. Um, again, it shows that 17, 18, um, but we're back, um, moving back in the right direction to get it uh, to where it needs to be. And that is the presentation. We welcome your questions. Super, thank you. I'm going to have Maureen lead off this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Um, clearly, this is one of the hospitals that has been struggling on operating margin for the past few years. And um, so I want to focus a bit on your profit and loss statement. So maybe, Jeff, if you could pull that up. And one question just to start off, um, are, are there any subsidies or benefits that are running through the P&L for the FQHC? For, for the nursing home? There is. In um, 2020, we are budgeting, uh, Jeff's getting the number. Sorry, just a second. For the nursing home, about, uh, sorry, 900,000 and 200 for the primary care. And those are expenses, correct? Yes. 
Um, I'm just looking through the P&L, when, when you look at, um, I guess, what is your opportunity for 340B? I mean, that's what we've seen, you know, a lot of hospitals, even this size, getting, you know, tremendous benefits from 340B and just wanted to find out because you have a pretty small volume there. Our 340B program, again, when it was, uh, um, when Gifford Healthcare was a part of the uh, Gifford Medical Center as a department and stuff, it's our primary care clinics that are uh, qualifying for the 340B um, revenues. And that is where um, the revenues are hitting is in Gifford Healthcare, not Gifford Medical Center. So that's why you're not seeing it reflected in our profit and loss statement. Okay. Um, and just looking at your 2019 projection, um, one of the things we looked at this year, and I think you got from the staff analysis, is kind of a quarterly breakout of where you're trending for the year. And your fourth quarter is looking to have a 27% increase, or 27% of your net patient revenue for the year. And it, it has been going up month, you know, quarter by quarter, so we've seen that trend. But just wanted to ask you, with a little more time has passed since you submitted the budget, you know, how are you feeling about the NPR forecast you have in there? So overall, we te um, you know, uh, we just gave to the Green Mountain Care Board um, our July um, actual data. We are expecting that our projections are coming into where we expected them to come in. Um, and so we feel confident in what uh, was presented in the, uh, um, the projected numbers for, um, for this budget. Okay. And then just sticking with NPR, and I'm not suggesting you change it, but um, I do want to applaud that you, know, you seem to be having, this year, a conservative forecast in there for your growth. I mean, obviously you're missing the budget for 2019, and that was a pretty significant increase over 2018. I mean, here, if we look at the change, which is just a little bit over a million dollars, um, your rate increases for commercial and the Medicare is like 2.2 million. So that's showing really that utilization is going down or mix is going down. Um, and that change of only a million dollars is pretty small compared to what it was even for this year. So just wanted to talk about if you think there's conservatism in the NPR. You know, we, we hope you're right. <laughs> Under promise, over deliver, right? <laughs> Exactly. Uh, we, um, yes, we definitely feel that uh, it's realistic, it's conservative, um, and um, I don't think we'll see that sort of spread between budget and actual uh, coming forward. So we definitely think it's attainable. Good. No, I think you do, I do as well. Like last year, I think one of the challenges was it was a pretty big increase on your budget over, you know, we know you kind of had been on a progression of a higher NPR, then you had the big drop in 2018. And I think it was a little hopeful in 2019 what the budget was. I think given our experience between 2017 and 2018, um, uh, it was a difficult uh, projection to make in, that, uh, in the last budget year. And I think we have more information to go on this year. And again, I think it's attainable and I think it's, I think it's conservative. Okay. And then can you talk about your achievement of cost savings? Because I know you do have a bunch of cost savings that you were rolling through. And just wanted to talk about, are they on the other operating expense line? And are you getting everything you expected in 19? And can you talk a little bit about 20? Um, so uh, if you'll bear with me a second, I just want to go a little further back uh, and talk a little bit about process. One of the things that, um, there's always been a, um, uh, a good culture of being um, responsible stewards of, um, of money at Gifford. Um, one of the things, given the situations that we, um, that we experienced and the um, difficulties we experienced was that we had to um, uh, ramp that up even more. Uh, so from a process standpoint, um, Jeff noted uh, just a couple minutes ago about a weekly meeting that uh, we have with uh, a number of people throughout leadership to uh, to look at um, uh, just to look at where we are in our process, where we are in our cycle, what we need to do to continue to save money, uh, what our volumes are looking like, matching the volumes up with our expenses and our expected expenses. We also are meeting on a daily basis with our entire leadership team. 
Uh, we're looking at what volumes we um, have uh, in that current day, what we've had in the last week. Uh, looking forward, Rebecca will bring in uh, what we're expecting for uh, providers in terms of vacations, uh, et cetera, so that we then can say, okay, we need to, um, uh, from a staffing standpoint, we need to staff down in particular areas because we know we're gonna have uh, people out. Um, so we're matching those expenses with our expected revenues and with our actual revenues. Uh, that has um, had a great impact in our cost savings, um, both in terms of being able to um, have people take vacations at the right time so that we're not overstaffed at times when we shouldn't be. Um, we also uh, have been able to utilize uh, low census policies that we have in place more effectively. Uh, and over the past couple of years, we have uh, reduced the number of FTEs uh, because of attrition. So that's been areas where we've seen the, uh, the biggest impact. Um, we've talked about some of the items that were in the, the narrative that we uh, put forward. Uh, Rebecca talked about a couple of items that we've done as well. Um, but the other part of the process is that um, uh, cost reductions and uh, stewardship of our resources goes throughout our organization so that it's not just a leadership team, it's people throughout uh, Gifford that are thinking of ways that they can save money. Um, we have our uh, materials manager and, our, um, and my assistant who uh, work together and have put a program in place where um, we're now um, looking at our thrift store that our auxiliary uh, operates for, um, uh, for office supplies. Uh, to see what's there. So instead of paying a buck and a half for a, for a pad of paper, they'll pay 25 cents uh, there. So uh, there's you know, things that like that that we've saved about $1,000 on this year up to uh, much larger uh, items. So it goes throughout our organization. It's a part of the culture and it's um, uh, something that will continue uh, moving forward. And we do feel that the, uh, the initiatives that we've put in place uh, some of the uh, cost savings that you've seen in our financials this year were things that we put in place last year. Some of the things that we're planning on um, impacting uh, in the coming budget are things we're putting in place now. So that lag uh, will continue to, uh, that lag in time from implementing and seeing those savings uh, will continue to move forward uh, as we go into 2020. And uh, I am confident we'll be able to continue uh, those efforts going forward. So, you, so do you see any risk then in what you've put in for cost savings for 19 as well as 20 or you think you're... I feel very confident what we have in there. Okay. And then um, just on the non-operating revenue because that's really what's helped you make your having a margin at all. And I know for 19 in the projection, I think you wrote about um, getting some... Uh, revenue, grant revenue, or of, of about 850000 or money that you've achieved through the community, and then the rest, is that really the change in your investments? And um, can you talk a little bit of the difference between the 19 projection to the 20 budget? Yeah, um, so it, it is what you just communicated. It's, uh, um, you know, um, the projection and uh, versus what we put in the budget. We're very conservative what we put in the budget for non-operating revenue. So the difference is how the market's doing currently to what we uh, um, actually build into our budget. So that, so the two point, the difference there, the extra two million is really pretty much the market performance. Yes. And then obviously for 20, don't really budget that, but right. it could happen if not. Um, okay. And one other area, just on your ACO reserves, um, what you have in for 19 and what you're proposing for 20, um, can you talk to that a little bit? Yeah, um, so unfortunately, uh, we did receive uh, um, our updated uh, um, numbers in July after we had submitted the budget. Um, we did for 19 have a, uh, um, a risk reserve of 238,000 that was, uh, um, was built into our budget. We did find out that uh, that should have been probably closer to 330,000, um, but in the 2020 budget we have uh, 238,000. So, are you going to be provided for 100% of 19 and 100% of 20, um, in as far as the maximum reserve? Yes, that's what our um, auditors are requiring at this time, due to uh, we don't have the history um, that we can, you know, and so that's what they require us to do. Right, but and hopefully that's going to be conservative too yes. when we go through. We hope. But. 
We well, we hope we don't hit the max on everything, right? Um, that's all I have. Thank you. Tom. <clears throat> well, I, I remember um, a while back you were here we were before at a meeting and you presented these, this list of cost savings and I, as I remember, it even had $100 items on it. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I applaud you for your diligence. It's resulted in the fact that over the last, since 2017, that you've uh, you kept uh, your operating expenses at a negative 3.6% growth rate. And uh, let's hope that 2020 is when the corner is fully turned and uh, better days are, are ahead because you've certainly earned them. Um, first question I have, again, is just uh, um, looking at your relationship uh, between bad debt and uh, free care is that um, <clears throat> bad debt has uh, actually declined from 2.9 million down to 2.3 over the last few years, and your free care has increased from 383,000 to 438. And I'm just always curious as to whether that is happenstance or is that a planned effort to move people from bad debt into free care and recapture some revenue out of your bad debt portfolio. Um, so I'd like to, you know, uh, say that that uh, you know I feel that Gifford. Um, is always looking, um, you know, before anything goes to bad debt, to make sure that uh, um, we're working with the uh, the patients up front, trying to get them onto payment plans, so that they don't get to that, uh, you know, that level where they have to go to bad debt. Mm -hmm. um, overall, I, you know, feel that the uh, the decrease, unfortunately, in bad debt is a reflection in the decrease in our revenue from 2017 to 2018, um, and that's what we're seeing. Um, our bad debt uh, overall has been holding true to historical trends that uh, um, we haven't seen it increase or decrease. So one, and just a short, another short one on bad debt, uh, one that stood out was the um, appendix where you kind of profiled bad debt moving from 2018 to 2019 and the amount that went to collections and what you recovered from collections. And you get the gold star um, of that 52%, according to the data you sent, 52% of what you sent to collections you um, uh, got rid of, you, you was uh, recovered. Um, those numbers are, um, <coughs> um, it's a big number that, that you recovered from collections 1.7 million out of 3.22 million that, that you sent. But I'm just, I'm just wondering that because this is not a, rigorously monitored form that, that we ask you to fill out, whether or not that truly reflects your experience that you, you know, from your collection agencies, you get a, a plus or minus 50% return on what you send to them. I would like to take the opportunity, this uh, um, schedule, this bad debt that uh, you're talking about, the Appendix 7, Yes. Um, I'd like to make sure that uh, all of us as organizations are uh, um, reporting it the same. We did have questions on, you know, like what is the appropriate way to fill it out. Yeah. Um, you know, 52. No, I, I clearly thought there was a high probability of that, yeah. but it, the number was stood out so much that I had to ask the question. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm looking at uh, your um, uh, Bridges document you know, where um, you profile from the rate increase a 1.3, uh, 1.34 million dollar uh, increase in commercial revenue from the rate increase, but then you have a 3.4 million dollar uh, reduction due to utilization and another 1.8 million dollar reduction due to reimbursement and payer mix. So that, there, you know, on a net basis, there is no gain. Um, and I'm just, I'm just wondering if, if those shifts in utilization and payer mix are things that you're worried about going forward. Um, I mean, these are, you know, to, to, to have your rate go up and have some return from that, but have that offset by some underlying factors. Uh, is that, how serious an area of concern is that for you? Well, our utilization has definitely been our um, primary concern. Um, you know, in 18, we did see that our net patient revenue did take a serious, you know, uh, dip. So that is the highest concern. Um, as we communicated, one thing that we have seen is our payer mix shift. Um, we're seeing that the Randolph uh, um, is aging, and we're seeing that it's moving out of our commercial into the Medicare. And so, you know, that's something I think last year when we came to this group, it was 
we were seeing a shift from the Medicaid population actually into Medicare. This year, it was a shift from our commercial payers into Medicare. But again, and again, in the Bridges document, you know, for uh, fiscal 19 approved budget, you're at 19.7 million. And uh, for the 20 budget, you're at 19, just a, uh, just a little over 19 million. And again, there is, there's an up because of the commercial rate, but a down because of utilization. So it's, it's, it, it, there seems to be a little bit of a war going on there that, uh, um, uh, you know, I'm just thinking about what does 21 look like and 22 look like if, if that continues on. So I'd refer back to the previous conversation that uh, Mar with, with Mari Yusufer. Uh, that's budget to budget. So yep. our actual performance in 2019, our actual volumes in 2019, were much different than what was in the budget. So that's not a real dip in utilization. So that that's a budget to budget. So and right. so um, you know, I, I actual to actual would not be as profound a change as that and. Um, you know, we are uh, we, we are seeing some some shift as Jeff indicated from uh, an aging uh, population, but um, it's not as it's not as big as it would be indicated in this because this is budget to budget. Yeah, can I just I'll just follow up on what Tom's asking there. What would be helpful is if you could give us a projection. You know, do that bridge chart from projection because you are a hospital that's missing significantly so I totally understand what you're saying Dan because it's going from 55.9 million approved budget to 49.6 for the 2020 budget but when you actually run the numbers on where you're trending um, to the new number it would be an increase so you know what, what we're what you're showing is a decrease because of the budget to budget right. but I think it would be important to have the chart from projection. So to rework the chart, but instead of using the 55, use the projected, and then show what it's going to the budget 2020. Yes. yes. Yep. Yeah. That'd okay. be good. That'll be follow up. Uh, again on first. bridges, and I fully appreciate this conversation about budget to budget. Um, under Medicaid, you have a changes in accounting of two million dollars, and uh, what is that? That is our ACO. So this That's is our first year. That's what I thought. But yep. I wasn't sure. Um, and uh, I guess my last question is, um, you, uh, and it's a common refrain, is that when it comes to Medicaid, you assume no increase in Medicaid. Um, wh why is that an assumption when Medicaid is a large part of the population that all hospitals serves? Well, that would come down to Medicaid increasing what, what they pay for reimbursement. So. Uh, unless there is a known increase through legislation or other, um, you know, uh, whatever the whatever the processes are, we can't assume that. So, uh, you know, I, if you're if you're um, suggesting whether we would support some increase in <laughs> Medicaid, I, I can say yes. I'm more more than suggesting it. I, I think. Uh, well, we agree with you. Thank from you. my personal observation, um, as I get deeper and deeper in this, I do worry that the cost shift is an existential threat to all that we're trying to do. And uh, so, um, I raise this issue with most hospitals because I think it's fundamental and structural, and uh, something that, uh, uh, with the advocacy from the bottom up, um, can be uh, redirected to some degree. Okay. Can I pile on, Tom? Pardon me? Can I pile on? Yes. So w what's been troubling to me, and I made a statement at the end of the day on Monday, is can you just imagine if the Green Mountain Care Board said no to all the, the charge increases that were asked for by the hospitals. There would be outrage, and yet there doesn't seem to be outrage by the hospitals about government continuing to underfund and shift costs onto a certain part of the population. So, just piling on. <laughs> so I, um, maybe I should just go on just the next question. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I'm so serious about this in a way that I, I looked uh, on the legislative web, website to see, uh, to make sure I knew who your senator was, which is Mark McDonald, but I wasn't sure. Um, and uh, I just, you know, having 
then a denizen of the State House one time and having served on House Appropriations um, and having you know worked with Governor Dean to start a VHAP, I know these things can change, but uh, they can only change if, if there is a united voice mm -hmm. um, uh, and a logical voice and a reasonable voice. And uh, all the hospitals have legislators that are their constituents. And mm -hmm. uh, if, they're not, if they're giving the message that we're just assuming that no increase in Medicaid is going to occur, then no increase in Medicaid is going to occur. Um, but I think Kevin's on the right track is that um, uh, this has to be discussed because those bills still get paid and they result in 10 and 12 percent increases in Blue Cross Blue Shield and, M and MVP. And the whole system gets kind of in an unbalanced gyration that uh, I, I think is uh, problematic. So uh, despite my previous comment, I will jump in a little bit. Um, so we do meet with our legislators regularly uh, and we do advocate for increases uh, in Medicaid uh, revenue. We actually hosted at Gifford the, uh, the, Senate, um, uh, the, the Senate Health and Welfare uh, Committee this year and we talked about uh, these issues. We hold legislative forums uh, where we talk about these issues and we get back and forth uh, in some of those and um, you know some of our suggestions and comments are not um, uh, you know it, it's not all um, you know uh, jovial some of them are, are tough conversations that's called that's called not being well received <laughs> that's called not being well received and um, so we do advocate for that as does uh, Vaz um, we also, uh, you know, we are a member of uh, One Care Vermont participating in the Medicaid program. Um, we are active with that organization as well and uh, do advocate through that means also to ensure that uh, the Medicaid revenues are um, uh, keeping up. Um, it's, um, yeah, as you know very well and um, uh, Kevin Mullen knows very well from his time in the legislature. It's it's not an easy um, easy thing, but we do advocate for that, and we will continue to advocate for that, um, and we'll make sure that um, we uh, follow up with you, let you know what we're doing. Thanks. The squeaky wheel gets the grease. It's very good. I did want to mention that uh, we had heard from Copley that they had received notice in late July that there was going to be a Medicaid rate increase uh, for outpatient services from 10% to 113% of the Medicare APC rate. Did you get a similar notification from Viva yet? Uh, yeah, we did. Okay. Uh, do you think that would impact uh, any of your budget submissions in terms of your assumptions? I'd have to go back and take a look, but I don't think by much. Okay, yeah, it doesn't seem like a huge rate increase, right. but uh, Copley did have a number associated, so that would be helpful. Um, so thank you for that. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit more about um, some of the utilization changes, um, the ER volumes being uh, reducing sounds like it could be directly related to some of your re work with your critical care team and making sure people understand what's going on. So that's actually great news, even though I know financially it's not great news, but I, it's certainly where we want to see care going. Um, I wondered if you could just give us a little more color commentary about if you know what kinds of root causes might be uh, reducing some of the surgical services. And if you don't, that's fine. I just, if you had any ideas about why that utilization was changing, whether it was related to something you were doing or out migration of people or less need, I don't know. Um, well, I don't know all the factors. And I, yeah, I, um, you know, we don't have uh, data to understand all the factors. I do know that, um, you know, as we've covered um, with you in uh, a couple of, <coughs> Probably many different uh, conversations that uh, you know we've had uh, some staffing issues in relation to providers over the last several years, and um, we have uh, begun to build those back. Um, uh, what is common, you know, I'm uh, in in my experience and working other places as well. Um, when you don't have someone to provide the service, service goes elsewhere. Uh, it doesn't immediately come back. Um, um, 
as uh, Jeff had indicated in some earlier comments, uh, we did build back our general surgery uh, volume, and yeah. um, you know we have seen our, our general surgery program, and we have seen that the volume return. Uh, Dr. White, uh, in particular, has been doing a lot of work with our medical staff as we have new uh, people coming in to make sure that um, our primary care providers are aware of what services they offer, um, that they develop uh, the trust and uh, reliability with those people um, and uh, we've also um, uh, one of the things we've done is we haven't um, tried to um, we haven't tried to employ all of those positions we've worked with other parties um, I saw the slide that uh, North Country put up before uh, about the different um, areas where they um, where they have uh, physicians coming in from other hospitals into their hospital and where they have physicians from their hospital going outside. We also um, utilize that uh, type of relationship so that we're not duplicating. Um, our orthopedic um, surgery, uh, Dr. White talked about um, the surgeon that we have that we're working with in orthopedics uh, with Dartmouth Hitchcock. Again, we're not duplicating. We're utilizing an existing person who is down there uh, to provide a service closer to where people are. Um, so we're doing all those, um, all of those things, but um, uh, you know, in some, for most part, our our issues there um, were because we lost, uh, be because we lost folks, and we're building it back. Thanks. Um, have you been looking at telemedicine in any way? You you didn't really talk too much about telemedicine today, and I wondered if you could just highlight what you're thinking around that type of service. We, um, we do have telemedicine, uh, telepsychiatry uh, that we utilize. Um, oh, right. No, actually, I do remember. I did have actually have a question specific to your, thank you, for right, your, uh, the telepsych in terms of, uh, it, I hadn't heard of the provider, Alpine Health, so I wanted to get a little more information about that. So uh, that is a service that was um, uh, a program that was started by a physician named Mark McGee, Dr. Mark oh, McGee, yeah, okay. formerly of Brattleboro Retreat. Yep. Um, so he is he is known, um, and uh, we've actually had already uh, some good success in utilizing him in a, uh, what has been a pretty difficult situation. Um, and he um, he is offering he offers that service to um, emergency department, our inpatient, and uh, to our practices as well. Although we do. We haven't utilized it, uh, as far as I know, for our practices, but we have for the other two centers. Successful. Uh, Dr. White and I um, attended a uh, presentation at uh, Bi-State Primary Care just in the last month um, around um, uh, utilization of, uh, of uh, telehealth services in different areas. Um, so we are investigating what uh, we might uh, be able to do. We have had discussions with some organizations that um, provide that, those services as well. So um, as of yet, we haven't um, you know, signed anything to increase that, but we are actively uh, investigating what our options are and what, um, how that might uh, benefit our service array and our patients. Great, thank you. Uh, I think that's all I have. Thank you. Okay, Jess. I guess I'm, I'm actually gonna jump a little bit on that, uh, the last question that Robin asked in the sense that I know cost reductions are really hard and uh, I applaud a lot of the efforts that you already have made on that and I think to some degree going it alone is getting harder and harder right I mean we've got fixed costs rising because med medical technology is becoming more costly we've got population declining so you're spreading those fixed costs over fewer and fewer people and what we've been hearing from some of the hospitals that are really uh, you know getting themselves out of financial crises is these collaborations whether it's telemedicine or whether it's sharing services, as it sounds like you're doing with ortho, with Dartmouth-Hitchcock, but, um, so I'm wondering if you can speak a little bit to, do you see more, I mean, you said, you know, you're exploring telemedicine right now. It sounds like there's a lot to be learned from some of the other hospitals that have done this successfully, but how about any other kinds of collaborations that would allow increased access to your community, maintaining quality, and perhaps reducing some costs? So we, um, you know, I, I gave the example of the orthopedics with Dartmouth Hitchcock. That's one of probably six or seven or eight uh, areas where we 
do those types of collaborations with, whether it's with Dartmouth-Hitchcock or whether it's with UVM or whether it's with Central Vermont. So we have a number of those collaborations. We also uh, are collaborating within our local communities. Um, uh, Rebecca uh, mentioned uh, Health Hub. Uh, that is a mobile uh, dental uh, service. Um, uh, we're, that is a much more efficient way of our uh, offering those services within our community than it would be for us to create our own service. Um, uh, we, um, uh, you know, we, we work with a number of different uh, entities um, uh, to provide um, uh, services in a more efficient uh, manner. Are there any more opportunities? I mean, can you see any future, even we've, more progress on that front? We've talked with, I think, every hospital within whatever the radius is, 50 miles, about uh, sharing services, about sharing uh, medical services, um, about, um, uh, you know, whether that's, you know, our having two days a week of a particular service, they're having three days, vice versa. Yeah. Um, the big obstacle right now is where are we going to find the people to fill those positions where we both have needs? Mm -hmm. um, we have a process, again, similar to what Brian was talking about with North Country and looking at the service line planning yeah. uh, around what services should be provided in our community. And what we're looking at are, um, you know, what are we referring out to other areas? Uh, what are the areas where there's the highest number of referrals going out to those areas? Um, and then taking a step back and saying, okay, is it appropriate for those services to go elsewhere? Or is it would be more economical and better for the patients if it were provided in the local community? Uh, and then if, it, if that latter is the answer, then how do we provide that? Is that something that there's enough volume, uh, enough need, uh, and it's efficient enough for us to, um, to hire that service, bring in that service. Do we do it that way or do we partner with another organization? So we also have that process uh, where we are uh, embarking on that. And again, we've talked with uh, pretty much every hospital within uh, 50 miles about uh, where we can uh, do that. Everybody is on board with doing that. It's a matter of uh, figuring out where we find the human resources to um, to have meet. success uh, with that. And when you, you just mentioned, you know, do we have enough volume? So you heard my earlier questions around the relationship between volume and quality. So how do you figure out what enough volume is to maintain a certain level of quality, knowing there is a correlation, at least on some procedures and surgeries, that you need to have a certain amount of volume to achieve a high quality outcome? How do you, how do you figure out what that number is? Because I have not been able to you know, find in the literature some of these, I mean, there's some minimum volume standards for some procedures that I'm seeing some hospitals adopt, uh, but again, there's a lot of procedures where there don't seem to be those. So how are you figuring it out? Um, well, we don't, we, we don't have that hard and fast metric either that, that, um, that you found so elusive in the literature. Um, we, um, we have implemented when we have new providers coming in uh, in our credentialing process um, we are uh, asking for um, information uh, to indicate either through training uh, if it's someone who is new into practice or um, uh, through their uh, past experience that uh, they exhibit um, a uh, expertise in that area that they, a proficiency in an area if they're doing a particular procedure that they're asking to do at Gifford so we do ask for that information. Our um, medical staff credentialing committee then looks at all that information and determines whether um, you know, they think it's appropriate for that service to happen at Gifford. We're also taking into consideration what are the other uh, supports that are uh, needed in order for us to provide a particular service. Do we need a higher level of uh, nursing expertise or do we need uh, particular other ancillary services around that and whether that's economical for us to do that. If it's not, we don't do it. Um, so there's a lot that goes into it um, and uh, there's, there's no uh, easy playbook to say, okay, you can check X, Y, and Z and then you can provide it. Right. Um, but uh, you know, we put as many safeguards in place to ensure that we're going to be able to do something safely and uh, appropriately and uh, you know, at a cost of care that's going to be appropriate for the for the patient and for the healthcare community. Okay. Uh, are you, I couldn't remember this and I should have looked quickly, but I'm sure you can answer this quickly. Are you part of a purchasing group? We are. Yes. Through, um, so uh, drug uh, costs and supply costs, you've been able to? It's called Health Trust. Health Trust, okay, thank you. Um, so speaking of the total cost of care, you knew I was gonna ask, right? So everybody <laughs> mm -hmm. was prepared for this. But, uh, you know, we put in the 
budget guidance, a table that was provided by the Green Mountain Care Board, not risk adjusted, um, not limited to care at Gifford. It's, it's the residents in your community. Um, I think we've seen that chart now twice this morning because the other hospitals have put up the, um, some data. So total cost of care per capita in Randolph is the highest um, in the state and the growth rate is you know 5.7 compared to 3.9 for the rest of the state. I understand that's not risk adjusted. So when you look at the blueprint um, profiles, that's also suggesting that the Randolph area has high total cost of care. And Dr. White, I really appreciate it. Sounds like you all have been doing some deep diving into understanding that data and the one care data is starting to help you to figure out where there are um, variations in, in cost relative to other parts of the state. So it sounds like you're really starting to dig into this. And I think, the, I'll speak for myself, I appreciate that because we do have some commitments to the federal government in terms of, you know, meeting a 3.5% growth in total cost of care. So understanding the areas where that might be growing faster or the absolute levels are higher is really important for us to understand. Um, the blueprint data is risk adjusted. And so to some degree, that levels off a little bit of the playing field. It's always not, risk adjustments are never perfect. Um, but it's still pretty high, and so it's still high even with that risk adjustment. And when you look at it, the resource use is high, inpatient discharges are high, imaging rates were high on that metric as well, particularly for low back pain that tends to be an indicator of overutilization, right, if it's low, uh, imaging for low back pain. And the preventable hospitalizations were high, and flu shots were low. So I guess my question, when I look at that, and I don't have a full understanding of the full story, and you all have been digging into it, I wonder, is there enough primary care delivery in your area in the sense of if flu shot rates are low and ambulatory care sensitive hospitalizations are high um, and you're starting, so I, I would ask you, what do you think about that? Is that? Could that possibly be an issue around primary care utilization access? Is that something that could be driving some of that? Um, I think that that um, could be a factor that plays into it. I, I, um, one of the reasons that we're utilizing the one care data uh, for us to tackle these issues. And we are uh, actively tackling all those issues and trying to understand all those factors yeah. and devise um, actions that will be effective. Uh, but the reason that we're utilizing the one care data for that is that it gives us the opportunity um, with patients who are actively engaged at Gifford currently mm -hmm. for us to make that impact. Yeah. Um, what we can't do is go back and look at, um, uh, you know, a, data that's uh, further back and we don't want to do that because it doesn't um, again doesn't allow us to necessarily work with patients who are yeah. coming into our practices now um, we've talked about in our previous um, time sitting in these chairs our struggles with bringing in primary care in the last several years um, we've seen over the last two years our um, our visits in primary care increase significantly um, so we think that we are making up um, some ground there and uh, you know our expectation is that over time um, uh, having better access to care in primary care having significant um, initiatives that we have in place uh, based on data that indicates where we have where we need to put attention we think those two things are going to begin to have positive impact um, yeah. but it also doesn't, uh, you know, that kind of change does not occur overnight. So um, sure. uh, we're hoping when we get back here next year, we'll see um, some um, incremental change there that, um, you know, we can point to. But uh, we are, um, you know, I can assure you that we are actively engaged in that work and uh, very serious about changing that. Yeah. Well, I, 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 I believe you and I really appreciate that. Yeah. Um, two quick questions then. What is your uh, average daily census? The, sort of the min and the max. We've been hearing from some hospitals how they swing. So I'm just curious to you, you've got, you know, your 25 beds, but what would be a min and a max over a month, say? Uh, we are seeing fluctuations from 18 all the way up, I mean, from, excuse me, 8 all the way to 23. So how do you staff when you have a day with 8 and a day with 23? Very careful. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and is that part of your cost issue of the, those swings, right? I mean, how do you... Staff it is. Um, uh, as I noted uh, uh, before, and um, I wasn't, probably wasn't quite as specific, but uh, those are some of the things we're looking at. If we, uh, you know, we have our daily huddle at uh, 7.45 in the morning and we're seeing that our, 
um, you know, that our census is quite low, we are doing um, low census staffing, uh, you know, whether that's in our nursing area. It also might impact our nutrition and food services because we don't have as many meals to serve that day. Right. Uh, maybe our environmental services, we don't have as many rooms to turn over that day, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, you know, we do that to the best of our ability. Uh, you do have to have a minimum level of staffing available. And then who knows, it might be, you know, we may have a surge in the emergency department and we uh, go from a census of eight to a census of 17 or 18 within uh, a five hour period and we have to bring some of those people back. So it's, um, it's not easy to do. Uh, it also um, impacts um, your staff yeah. um, who are being uh, called off uh, and put on low census uh, a call. So uh, that's uh, difficult, but, um, Does that but hurt, we do manage hurt recruitment? it recruitment. Does that hurt recruitment? Um, it can, um, you know, I, I can't point to it right now and, and, and um, I, I think we've um, had better luck in the last uh, year in, um, in regard to our uh, staffing in those areas, but um, it definitely um, does have an impact. Um, as Jeff noted um, in going through some of the stats, uh, we've had as many, we've, we've hit our targets in terms of our, our, our budget in terms of the number of patients we've had in the hospital. Uh, our discharges are uh, on par with our budget. It's the length of stay that um, has changed. That's a good thing. Yeah. Um, you know, that means that uh, we're reducing our length of stay for orthopedic procedures. It indicates that some of those quality projects that uh, Dr. White talked about, they're having an impact. That lowers the total cost of care. Uh, so those are good things. Um, but there's a lot of work that has to go into it, a lot of management. Um, that has to go into it to ensure that you know we still have um, highly qualified, engaged people um, uh, caring for those patients um, you know, day to day and year to year. Thank you. All right. So my final question is: This is really just trying to get a sense of relative pricing. So, if on average Medicare reimbursed a hundred dollars, what would the commercial average reimbursement be? For did that calculation by one sixty six. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yep. That's it for me. Thanks. Dan, if uh, miraculously we, we could convince the state colleges to start a PA program, would Gifford be willing to step up to the plate to um, create some clinical placements for students? For a PA program? Yes. Uh, yes, we, um, we, we would. We already do that. Yes. We are. But I think you're doing it with an out-of-state institution, right? Yeah, we do that with a number of uh, institutions. From PA perspective, uh, uh, we work with Franklin Pierce. We also work with a, a number of nursing schools, uh, um, including uh, places like Norwich and VTC. Uh, there has been discussion about uh, including uh, residency experiences for general surgery as well. Perfect. When you could you actually describe what your process is, um, what your methodology, what your calculations were to determine that five percent was the appropriate change in charge to ask for? So again, um, and I think we're going to be resonating with the other uh, organizations that have communicated. It's our budget process um, to begin with. Uh, we go down to the departmental level. Um, we ask them for the key, um, you know, what is their volumes, what are their expenses. Um, that's step one. We make sure we ensure that the expense, uh, um, you know, uh, we run it through multiple passes to make sure that we have our true expenses. We figure out what our net revenues would be without the rate increase. And then we look at, you know, basically what we need our operating margin to be and then um, account for what the uh, rate increase is from that point. And it looked like from your uh, submission that your 5% seemed to be across the board. You didn't uh, selectively target areas, correct? Our net, uh, when we actually institute a rate increase at Gifford, mm -hmm. the first step that we do is we look at all our supplies, our pharmaceuticals as well as our med surge supplies. We then go through and we make sure that they, uh, um, you know, we raise those according to what they're costing. Then we'll take a look at, you know, what our overall rate increase, you know, what that has consumed. And then we'll spread the rest based on, uh, um, based on that so that we do come in at the average. 
So we do have, it's not an across the board. We'll actually make sure that our supplies are priced appropriately, that our pharmaceuticals are priced appropriately, and then whatever they consume, whatever's left, we then apply it to the rest of the charges. Okay.